let us pray. Almighty Father, look with mercy on this your family, for which our Lord Jesus Christ was content to be betrayed and given up into the hands of sinners to suffer death on the cross, who is alive and glorified with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. And now we will have our Old Testament reading. The book of Isaiah is the first of the writings of the prophets in the Bible, and Isaiah, the author, is generally considered to be the greatest prophet. This lesson is titled, The Suffering and Glory of the Servant. Servant refers to the Messiah. Isaiah, chapter 52, beginning at the 13th verse. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted, just as there were many who were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him, for what they were not told they will see, and what they have not heard they will understand. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we were held in low esteem. Surely he took up of our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers it is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of this generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, by righteous servant, will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Now we will have our New Testament reading. The New Testament reading is taken from the letter to the Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14 Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, 
but we have one who in every respect has been tested, as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, John and Eunice, for giving us our Old Testament and New Testament readings. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the Gospel of John. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who had betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often went there with his disciples. So Judas bought a detachment of soldiers, together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, For whom are you looking? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, for whom are you looking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back in its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest, that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of these men's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing round it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly in the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the, the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him, bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? 
Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfil what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own? Or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no cause against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now, when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now, it was the time, it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. 
Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scriptures, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because the Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may believe. His testimony is true and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look upon the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloth, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now, there was a garden in a place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus here. 
This is the passion of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When they were in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Peter cut off Malchus's ear, and Jesus healed him, he said a very key thing. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? Today is Good Friday the day when we commemorate the death of Jesus. The death of a good man, definitely. The death of a teacher, the death of a healer, but the death of much more than that. Jesus, as God incarnate, Emmanuel, God is with us. God died on the cross that day. What it doesn't say in John's Gospel, but it does in others, that was that when Jesus breathed his last, the earth went dark and there was an earthquake. And it was almost as if there was a rip in the threads of life itself. When we think about Jesus dying on the cross, it is very hard. Quite often we'll skip this bit a bit and go more to Easter Day when he rose again. We are in a privileged position to know that. But actually, let's stick with Good Friday for a moment, for it is supremely important. The importance of God dying on the cross is that God has been there. God has known non-existence with us. God has gone through death. I just think this is so important for all those who have died and for all those who are so poorly that they are dying, particularly of COVID-19 at the moment, but also of other problems, health problems. If we had a God that hadn't been there, then we would question that he could truly be with us in our journey through life, through death and beyond. You will see, I hope in a moment, some pictures of the church. The church is empty. It has been stripped bare, as it always is actually on Good Friday. But the light over the ombre cupboard is now stuff, snuffed out, an indication that Christ is not present in our church. As we look upon the cross where he died, we know he truly died and we know and can have confidence that when we die and when our loved ones who have already died and those who are dying today, we know that they will pass through the journey that Jesus passed through because God, our creator, had that time of non-presence. He had that time of not being known. I always find it so moving when I snuff out that candle in the church. I feel bereft that God is not with us. Again, we are in a privileged position this day because we know God has passed through that veil and is always with us. But the pivotal part of our humanity still stands when Jesus was dead on that cross. We know solidarity. We know that he is always with us because his journey went on. I pray that this gives us all hope, that we have a God 
who knows us, who journeys with us and has been there and will always be there now for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. When I say, Lord, hear us, please say to yourself at home, Lord, graciously hear us. God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Therefore, we pray to our heavenly father for people everywhere, according to their needs. We pray for the Church of God throughout the world, for unity in faith, in witness and in service, for bishops and other ministers, for those whom they serve, for Andrew, our bishop, and Joe, our suffragan bishop, for the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this place, for those to be baptised, for those who are mocked and persecuted for their faith, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love and preserve it in peace. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is governed and sanctified, Hear our prayer, which we offer for all your faithful people, that in their vocation and ministry, they may serve you in holiness and truth to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Let us pray for the nations of the world and their leaders. We pray for Elizabeth, our Queen, and we pray for our government and our parliament, we pray especially for Boris Johnson at this time, for, all, for his continued improvement in health. We pray for those who administer the law and all who serve in public office, for all who strive for justice and reconciliation, that by God's help the world may live in peace and freedom. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Most gracious God and Father, in whose will is our peace, turn our hearts and the hearts of all to yourself, that by the power of your Spirit, the peace which is founded on justice may be established throughout the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for God's people throughout the world, of all cultures and creeds, of all religions, and those of no religion. We pray for a greater understanding and a greater learning between people. We pray for the removal of blindness and of ignorance and of bitterness of heart. We pray that God will grant us all grace in this time where we are living in the challenge of COVID-19. We pray through helping each other we may grow to know the grace that is yours that you have given us and we thank you for it, Lord God. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Merciful God, creator of all the people and of all the creatures of the earth, have compassion on us all. Help us by the nurturing of your creation that it may be healed from all the pollution and damage we have done. We ask that we look to your vision of creation and not our greed and our selfishness. We pray this prayer through Christ our Lord, who gave so generously of himself that he died on the cross. Amen. Let us pray for all those who suffer, for those who are deprived or oppressed. We pray for all who are sick, 
whether it be of the COVID-19 virus or through other sickness. We pray for all who are in hospitals, care homes and hospices at this time. We pray for those in darkness, in doubt or despair, in depression, loneliness and fear. We pray for prisoners and captives and refugees. We pray especially at this time for victims of domestic abuse, for whom staying in poses difficulties every day. We pray for a time of calm, a time of non-violence and a return to safety. We pray also for all at the point of death and those who watch beside them that God in his mercy will sustain them in the knowledge of his love. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Almighty and everlasting God, the comfort of the sad, the strength of those who suffer, hear the prayers of your children who cry out in any trouble, and to every distressed soul grant mercy, relief, and refreshment through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us commend ourselves and all God's children to his unfailing love and pray for the grace of a holy life that with all who have died in the peace of Christ we may come to the fullness of eternal life and the joy of the resurrection. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son Jesus Christ delivered and saved humankind, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we too may triumph in the power of his victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.